Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon to those of you that are on the East Coast. Um, my name is Maria Rennie. I'm the Deputy Consul General here in Chicago. Um, let me start by saying a big thank you to all of you for joining today's session. I realise that there's a number of other places that you could have been right now. We've all got such busy schedules. So I'm really thrilled that you've been able to take the time to join us today. Uh, thank you so much for that. We will repay that by providing you with a, a very interesting conversation this morning, I promise. So a few bits of housekeeping before we start. We're all quite familiar with these types of sessions and how they'll run, so I'm not going into a huge amount of detail. But just to let you know, we've set this up today as a webinar, which means that our speaker, Sandra Morgan, and I can both speak and we can both be on camera. But I'm afraid that you all in the audience won't be able to do the same, so you won't be able to turn your camera on and nor will you be able uh, to chip in vocally. But please make really good use of the chat bar and the Q&A box. Uh, Sandra and I do really want you to participate as much as possible today. It's actually my role in the session today is just to feed your messages and your questions into Sandra. So I'll be monitoring that chat and that Q&A and updating Sandra with what's in there. And one final point on Q&A is just to say a big thank you to Patrick Kane in the Embassy in DC and also to my colleague Freya in Chicago at Freya McKnight who is both behind the scenes holding this together for Sandra and I. And fingers crossed, uh, neither of them have to do too much troubleshooting for us today. So let me tell you now a little bit about our speaker, Sandra. So Sandra Morgan is our honorary consul in the state of Ohio. And she's actually been doing that role since 2002, believe it or not. She also has a number of other responsibilities outside of being an honorary consul and outside of her day job. So she is a, a, gov a governor appointed member of the Ohio Commodores. And she's also a board member of the US leadership, Global Leadership Coalition. She's a member of another, a number of other organizations. Um, but despite all that, she still somehow, somehow manages to find time to actually do a full-time job as well. So she works for Kent State University and she's a director of external affairs and communications at the College of Arts and Sciences. And some of Sandra's colleagues from Kent State University have been able to join us for the session today. So welcome to you all. We're so thrilled that you've been able to join us. So today's Black History Month celebration session is gonna have a little bit of a, a Midwest flavor. It was always the intention of our Chicago Meg chapter to focus on the Midwest today. And when we were doing some research about today's session, we discovered that students at Kent State University we're actually the first people to propose that we celebrate Black History as an entire month. And so naturally that led us straight to Sandra's path because she works there. And we had a conversation with Sandra about how we might theme today's session. But in those conversations, Sandra was generous enough to start sharing some of her personal history about her grandfather. And he has a fascinating story. He is the inventor and entrepreneur, Garrett Morgan. Um, and so we decided instantly upon hearing uh, Sandra's stories of her grandfather that we had to make this a, a dual theme session today. There was just no question about that. So we're still going to be Ohio based for the hour today, but we are going to focus not only on origins, but also on innovation. So I think you've probably heard about enough from me for now. So Sandra, if you're ready, I'd love to hand over to you and ask you to to take us to join you in Ohio this morning. Well, thank you, Maria. I really appreciate it. And to all of my friends, colleagues, and everyone across the network who may be listening or participating in this um, webinar, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here to talk to you today, uh, not only about Black History Month and the role that Kent State University played in its development, um, but also to share, you know, what for me is a really very proud legacy um, of my grandfather, his impact not only on the state of Ohio, um, but really globally, um, and how that fits into the larger picture of Black history in this country. Before I do that, I would like to thank and everyone who's been a part of putting this together. Um, you know, they encouraged me to speak with you. I wasn't quite sure that it was going to resonate. Um, I hope it does. Um, but uh, they were so encouraging and so 
gracious in inviting me to speak, you know, it was uh, it was an offer I could not refuse. And for that, I am really uh, I'm really thankful and and grateful. So if you are ready, then you know, let's talk about Black history. Um, you know, those of us here today know the long and intertwined history between the U.S. and the U.K., all right? So since before our uh, conscious uncoupling, if you will, um, our nations have been on uncommonly common ground. One important legacy that both of our countries shares is Black history. You know, Black people have been a contributing member of both of our societies since they arrived on these shores in 1619, and in the UK for centuries. You know, given the important ways that both of our countries have been influenced by the Black presence, I think it's really appropriate that we celebrate Black history together here today. Black history is our history, and I mean that sincerely. The Black experience is woven into the fabric of both of our nations, our failures and our triumphs. In the United States, no state has been more important to Black history than Ohio. Geography plays a pretty significant role in that because, obviously, the Ohio River separated free state Ohio from slaveholding state Kentucky, and untold numbers of enslaved people crossed the Ohio River into freedom and really to forge a new experience and a new life for themselves. They were welcomed and helped throughout the state by a well-connected series of stops called the Underground Railroad here. And Ohioans were very progressive. Um, you know, Ober Oberlin College was the first college in the United States to admit students without regard to race or gender. That's pretty impressive considering that this was 1835. Before the Civil War, Oberlin enrolled more black students than any other college or university in this country. By 1900, they had produced one third of all African-American college graduates in the country. And that includes women. In fact, the first African-American woman to receive a college degree in this country and probably any other was from Oberlin College. In more modern times, Kent State University was the first to acknowledge and celebrate Black History Month, even before it was a national holiday. It's important to note that previous to 1970, Black history was really um, celebrated for one week. It was typically the second week of February. And that was, um, you know, that was brought forward by Carter G. Woodson. And the reason that they celebrated in February, um, I mean, it's not a short shrift uh, to our community, but it was in celebration and acknowledgement of both Frederick Douglass's birthday and uh, Lincoln's birthday right, both born in February. And so, you know, these are two great influencers on African American freedom, um, self-possession, and destiny. And so it seemed appropriate to celebrate in this month, but it was only for one week. At Kent State University, a, a number of very progressive thinking students and administrators and faculty members decided that one week really wasn't enough, that there was a, a broad range of achievement and pride in our community that needed to be celebrated more fully. And so at Kent State University, they decided to celebrate for an entire month. You know, they placed it on the calendar and they, and they celebrated for a, for a month. This was in February of 1970. They continued that tradition uh, throughout time, uh, but more importantly, they advocated um, on the national level to make sure that Black History Month was celebrated universally. That resulted in 1976, the Carter administration adopting Black History Month. It's a legacy that Kent State University is extremely proud of, and I think we should be. Um, and it's something that we now see spreading all around the world, uh, an acknowledgement of Black contribution universally. Yesterday, I, I will draw your attention to the fact that yesterday there was a lovely article in the New York Times uh, that chronicles the history of Black History Month, uh, and Kent State was prominently mentioned in that article, and we are all, again, very pleased by that. Ohio was also a hub for innovation uh, in general, and also for African Americans. 
You know, Ohio nurtured brilliant minds like Granville T. Woods, who was born in Columbus. He was born a free man, but he dedicated his life to developing a variety of inventions, um, all related to the railroad industry. Transportation was important. I hope you're getting this trend. Um, he received over 40 patents related to train related, um, you know, everything from uh, communications to, you know, improving lines and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'd also like to point out another African American inventor and entrepreneur who, as you already know, is my favorite. You know, he was um, my personal hero in addition to being an entrepreneur, um, an inventor, and a civic leader. Um, my grandfather, Garrett Morgan. You know, if I can qualify my grandfather's life, I would separate it into three different areas. Garrett Morgan, the adventurer, Garrett Morgan, the entrepreneur and inventor, and then finally, Garrett Morgan, civic leader. I'd like to share that, you know, throughout all of this, he was um, a steadfast family man, family first. Um, and he wanted to make sure that his family was well taken care of and that they were, that they moved into the mainstream of American society full of confidence and, and knowing um, that we could achieve anything. And I think that he really did hit the mark on that. So let's talk about Garrett Morgan, the adventurer first. He was born in Kentucky in 1970, or I'm sorry, 1877, uh, you know, shortly uh, after the abolition of slavery. It was Reconstruction. Um, he was given what was typical of um, an education then, which was an elementary school education. He went to sixth grade. Uh, but he was a very precocious young man um, and decided that at that point he was not going to stick around in Kentucky. Um, you know, he had had uh, enough of Jim Crow and the behaviors that were uh, endemic at the time and thought he, was, he would cross the river and come to Ohio, which he did. You know, he was an enterprising young man, smart, and thought, well, let's see what happens. So he moved to Cincinnati. He was about 14 years old then. He decided to leave home without his parents, without his brothers and sisters, on his own. He struck out. He walked not took an Uber, not drove, but he walked to the banks of the river, caught a ferry, and got to Cincinnati. He found a job very quickly there, um, but found out also that discrimination was every bit a part of the fabric of Cincinnati as it was in Kentucky. He just wasn't far enough away from the South. In the meantime, he heard some really great things about Cleveland. You know, Cleveland was, um, at the time, a hub of innovation. Um, you know, there were the Rockefellers were here, Edison was here, there was, a, there was a lot going on. And so he thought, well, you know what, I'm going, I'm striking out and I'm going for the, for the big city. I'm going to the bright lights of Cleveland. And he literally hitched a ride on a train, not by buying a ticket, um, but by jumping on the train and sitting in one of the cars and riding from Cincinnati to Cleveland. When he got to Cleveland, he arrived with, as he said, a dime in his pocket, literally, but with hope in his heart. Um, he was a hard worker, he was enterprising, and he thought he could make a way. So once he got himself sorted out here in Cleveland, um, he found himself a job um, and, and started working. That while he worked in the textile industry, which was big in Cleveland at the time, uh, this was right around the turn of the century, and Cleveland actually was either two or three in the textile industry behind New York. There were lots of Eastern Europeans who had come to the city uh, in search of, well, you know, opportunity and jobs, just like him, um, and they worked in these they worked in these various factories, um, sewing clothes and all sorts of things. And he worked in one of those factories too. He was the handyman. While he was there. He met my grandmother, who was a bohemian seamstress. Well, you can imagine the hubbub that that caused. An interracial relationship at the turn of the century was frowned upon, uh, whether you were in the South or really no matter where you were. And so they were given an ultimatum. Either you end this relationship, stop talking to each other, and you know, separate yourselves into you know, what we think should be your roles and, and uh, areas or you have to leave you have to leave 
Well, my grandfather and my grandmother, who were not married at the time, but soon were thereafter, decided we're going. And they left uh, Root McBride and decided to get married um, and then find their way. So that, that's Morgan the Adventurer. Morgan the Adventurer became Morgan the Entrepreneur because of this situation. So, you know, he left Ruth McBride and, you know, knowing that he and my grandmother were married, that they were going to be met with the same opposition no matter where he went. And so he decided to start a business of his own. You know, he was handy, um, mechanically inclined. And so he started a company uh, initially fixing sewing machines and then ultimately doing piecework for a couple of the, the uh, businesses around town and then expanding his business even more, um, you know, which was great because now he was employing people in the community of all ethnicities. Um, you know, he was, he was making a way for his family. Not only did he have that business, but you know, I'm gonna use a local kind of vernacular, he was a hustler. He had, a, he had a poultry shop, he had a clothing shop. He did anything and everything that he could in order to make a way for his growing family um, and also to, uh, to, explore, to explore his ideas. It worked out very nicely for him. Um, pretty soon he was working very comfortably. You know, he was providing a nice living for his family. Um, and he was able to really think a little more broadly about what it is that he'd like to do. Um, so one of the things that, and this is kind of funny, you know, when they were sewing, putting together these, um, you know, they were working with white cotton in particular, sewing shirts. And when they were sewing, it would move very, the, you know, move quickly. And so it would sometimes scorch the fabric because the needle would get really hot and it would you know scorch the fabric where it was sewing I um, mean that was problematic so he was in his workshop looking for a lubricant that he could use um, on the on the needles that number one wouldn't stain the fabric but also would provide for um, you know ease of movement without the friction on his needles and um, and was called away to lunch so he went he wiped his hands went inside, had his lunch, came back to his workshop and noticed that the, the hairs, the fabrics on the cloth that he used had straightened. He said, oh, this is interesting. I wonder, you know, I wonder what, this, what else this could do. So he uh, called over his Airedale dog and put a little bit of this, this concoction on the dog and it straightened the dog's hair. So he thought, hmm. He put some on his own hair, which in my opinion was a very dangerous thing to do, but he put some on himself and it straightened his hair as well. He thought, Eureka, I've got, I may not have solved the issue of the sewing machine needle, but I think I have something else that I can work on. And from that was born the Garrett Morgan Hair Refining Company. Uh, again, at this time, consider the, the circumstances. Um, Madam C.J. Walker was very much on the scene. Um, you know, she was making a lot of money. It was a time when beauty and self-care was becoming increasingly more important to an increasingly more prosperous African-American community. My grandfather saw this as a business opportunity and he launched his company. Um, and he literally traveled all over uh, the East Coast of the United States um, selling his products directly to consumers, but also stocking various uh, drug stores and barber shops and, and that sort of thing with his product. He even got a patent, his first one, for a hair comb, a hot comb is what it was called, um, that you heated up and then used to straighten out your hair. Now, you could not use both the hot comb and his hair straightener. Um, you had to use pick one or the other, but um, you know, it was the beginning of a, of a growing and very profitable business for him. In fact, he had a, a whole portfolio of hair products, um, all of them safe and, uh, safe and biodegradable and uh, all that sort of thing. In fact, when he would make demonstrations at various barber shops, at the end of his demonstration, he would drink a small bottle of this stuff in order to prove that it was safe and that it wasn't going to uh, that it wasn't going to harm the people who used it. Ingenious. He had a, a million.
is that he found a way um, to capitalize on the market and to, uh, again, make money in support of his family uh, and also give himself a little bit more time to think. So what was his next thing? Well, you know, he, this, again, within the context of the times, and let's remember that he didn't think of himself as a big inventor or anything like that. He was an entrepreneur, and that was first and foremost in his mind. So um, he noticed that during the course of, of everything that was going on, lots of factories, lots of you know, manufacturing, all kinds of cool stuff going on, but also a time of lots of accidents, um, lots of explosions, lots of fires, that sort of thing, and people were seriously hurt. Within the textile industry in particular, people were, you know, there was always fires. And it, unfortunately, it was usually young women, young immigrant women, who suffered and paid the cost for this because they frequently died. And they died because firemen and police could not get into the buildings uh, for any given amount of time in order to rescue them. So they, you know, they either perished from, um, the fire itself or from fumes or for, you know, trying to jump out of windows and that sort of thing. So, you know, my grandfather gave this some thought and said, you know, there's gotta be a way that policemen and safety, you know, safety folks can get in there and actually rescue people. He went back into his workshop and designed a, the Garrett Morgan safety hood. Now, the safety hood looked like you know, I don't know, something from voyage to the bottom of the seas. It was a big hood that went over one's head, you know, went down the, the front and, and ended with um, two things. Number one, a filter pack on the back. And number two, tubes down uh, towards the ground. Um, his, you know, his um, safety hood was ingenious and got a patent because of two things. Number one, the the pack um, that allowed um, air to flow through. It was like a water pack, okay? And so it, it trapped heat and it also um, was able to to trap some of the some of the noxious fumes and the poisons that were that were in the air. But more importantly, it had two tubes towards the uh, towards the floor. And those tubes then allowed cool air and clean air to circulate through the, the safety hood and allowed um, an individual up to about a half an hour to be inside of toxic, uh, any kind of toxic situation and, and get people out. Well, you know what, he took, this, uh, he took this item to the New York Safety Expo of 1912 and he won first prize. He was delighted. They were selling like hotcakes. I'm gonna point out one thing to you though as to why it, they were selling like hotcakes and what happened subsequently. When he went to the to the expo of 1912, um, he could not go as himself. He was not allowed. So he hired a white man uh, to go in with him um, and pose as Garrett Morgan. My grandfather then posed as um, a Native American from a Canadian tribe so that no one would say, well, I don't know, what about, you know, they wouldn't ask around, I suppose. But anyway, um, you know, he, cha he was Big Chief Mason and he, uh, you know, went through this whole ritual of showing how you could use the safety hood and, you know, going into a smoke filled room and being in there for a while and then coming out to the astonished gasps of people. And, uh, and when he won first prize, um, you know, they were falling all over themselves to buy this safety hood. He made quite a nice living off of this and off of this safety hood and patented it and then ultimately gave it to the government. Okay, so fantastic, how wonderful. Until 1916. In 1916, there was a big explosion under Lake Erie. They called on my grandfather. I mean, it was it was big. They hit an air pocket um, of gas and people were killed. They were thrown all over. It was a big deal because they were literally five miles away from the shores of, you know, Ohio and under Lake Erie. They were, they were digging, um, you know, tunnels for uh, water intake. 
essentially um, what is now our, what our, our water filtration plant. But when they hit that pocket of gas, these men were, the ones who were still alive were trapped and they were trapped five miles away from shore and under the lake. Frightening in my opinion. Anyway, they called on my grandfather to uh, use his safety hoods to go underneath and rescue them, which he did. There were very few people who were willing to go with him because they were scared. The first group of rescuers had gone down there and they died because they didn't have the appropriate equipment. So my grandfather and his brother in their pajamas and no shoes went under, took the chute or the, the shaft down under the lake and then out uh, five miles. Saw the pandemonium that was going on loaded dead bodies into those big carts, put those who were living on top, brought it five miles back to shore and then up. Imagine all the, the excitement, the hurrahs that went on there. Well, then others put them on, went underneath, um, you know, and they got, they retrieved the, the bodies, of uh, those people who were, who were trapped under there. And it, it was all over the papers. It was in the papers in Cleveland, Chicago, New York, everywhere. No one mentioned Garrett Morgan. No one mentioned his invention. Even though he was front and center in the photos, he was not, he was he was invisible. He was not um, acknowledged in any way. And, you know, there were big, um, the Carnegie uh, Foundation, as an example, gave medals to all of the other men who were down there um, bringing out bodies. They got bonuses from the city. There, was, there were a lot of accolades for everyone except for my grandfather, without whose invention they would have never survived. When it was uh, discovered that Garrett Morgan was the true inventor of the traffic of the gas mask and that he was central to this, uh, to this effort, they stopped buying the gas mask. Literally, they thought, well, you know, he's a black man and we're not going to support his business. And that literally happened. It was um, one of his great disappointments, but he chose not to allow that to, uh, to deter him from moving forward. So whereas he did very well with those, at least initially, um, he gave his patent to the government and he recognized his importance to safety efforts um, you know, not only for firemen and police officers and others, uh, you know, in our country and now worldwide, um, but certainly to the war effort uh, in World War I and then beyond. So there you have that. Well, so he said, okay, fine, I'm going to go back to my regular business practices. I'm going to do what I was doing, you know, the hair care systems, the, all this other stuff that I've got going, fine. But I need to advertise my, I need to advertise my um, products because I'm really tired of driving all over the place. I'm really tired of these, you know, he literally had a calliope on the back of a truck and he would drive around with that. He said, that's, uh, you know, I, I'm tired of that. I'd like to advertise. So we reached out to the local newspapers who kindly told him, um, you know, we like you, Mr. Morgan, but we cannot accept your advertisements. Um, you know, these our advertising uh, pages are dedicated to the majority community. So my grandfather said, okay, that's fine. Um, I think I can, I know what to do. He started his own paper. It was called the Cleveland Call. Ultimately became the Cleveland Call and Post. Um, but he said, and uh, he told everyone, Number one, I want to hear good news about my community. I want to be able to share what's happening in the African American community, um, you know, throughout Northeast Ohio. And I know others are interested in this news as well. And number two, it's a vehicle not only for me to advertise, but for other African American businesses as well. So, guess what? It was wildly successful. Not only did he have reporters on the beat and a whole slew of paper boys um, who, you know, sold the paper, delivered it, did everything, um, but he was raking in the money for advertising hand over fist because not only did African American businesses want to advertise within their community, but guess what? 
everybody else wanted to advertise in the community too. It was literally, um, you know, tracking the dollars. So uh, it was, a, it was a, a marvelous success for him. The thing that happened that was really marvelous about it though, was not only was he successful, but he influenced the other newspapers. They said, well, you know what, Mr. Morgan, I think you've got an idea here. Uh, we are gonna open our newspapers to advertising for everyone. Now, you know, if I'm being honest, we know that it was, I think they were astonished to see how much money was actually involved in advertising in the minority communities of the time. Um, but also, uh, you know, I think that it was ultimately a benefit for everyone. Everyone got to advertise wherever they wanted and reach the audience possible for their merchandise, for their services, and for their goods. So we're going to chalk that up to a success and a benefit to everyone. The community benefited. Finally, um, you know, one of the other things, and probably his most famous invention or service, uh, if you will, is the uh, three position traffic signal. You know, it, again, if you consider what was happening across the country, everybody was growing. You know, there were all sorts of vehicles on the road. There were, well, there were pedestrians, there were horses, there were carts, there were automobiles. You name it, it was on the road. And traffic flow was a problem. Um, you know, the, the traffic signals that it existed in the previously, including the traffic signal that was invented in the UK um, <clears throat> by Mr. McKnight and put up in front of Parliament in 1868, only had two colors, red and green. <clears throat> Excuse me. And those, uh, you know, red and green just meant stop or go, essentially. Um, so if you were in the intersection, what do you do? Where do you go? Do you keep going or do you stop? Then as now, most accidents took place within the intersection. So my grandfather, um, after seeing a really terrible accident and having both two of his three children in the car with him, thought something needs to be done with this. Something needs to, you know, this is, it, it's untenable. So once again, he went home, back to his workshop, and believe me, this workshop was, it, it was infamous. It was famous and infamous, this workshop, because there was everything known to man in there, nothing of which you could touch, but lots to look at. Uh, anyway, lots of chemicals, and uh, I mean, it was really a mad scientist's place to be, but at any rate, um, he went back to his workshop and put his thinking cap on and came up with this three position traffic signal. So what he determined and what we know now is that um, transporta with transportation flows, you've got to give people ample warning of what to do. So his, his invention or his improvement to the traffic signal really was the all clear the intersection. So in other words, if you are traveling towards an intersection and you see a yellow light or you see the arms positioned in a certain way, that means stop, do not enter the intersection. If you're in the intersection and you see the lights change, get out, get out of the intersection, leave the intersection clear, all clear the intersection. Genius. So simple, and yet, you know, it took uh, it took quite a while for someone to come up with that. He he applied for and received his patent in 1923. Uh, remembering the uh, issue with the safety hood, he then decided that it wasn't worth trying to establish, um, you know, an offshoot of his business to manufacture these things or to sell them around the, the country to various municipalities. So he sold his patent to General Electric. He sold that in 1924 for uh, roughly $40,000, about $40,000, um, which in today's currency is uh, approximately $611,000. Well, in 1924, that was a bunch of money. And it was by then he also was um, a middle-aged man uh, and decided that it was time for him to turn his attention away from inventing and, you know, business. Business was running just fine. He was doing very well now. Um, you know, he was able to take care of his family.
he was able to uh, provide actually for, you know, future generations, myself included, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so he turned his attention to being a civic leader. This is really the third part of his life. Um, you know, he was financially comfortable. He was known in his community broadly and decided that it was time to, uh, to really take on some of the issues of the day. Um, you know, there was a, a nice African-American community in Cleveland. Um, you know, they were, of course, stratified uh, ec economically and educationally. But he decided that he wanted to be of help to his community specifically. Um, and so he was a member of what was called the Negro Businessman's League. He was a member of the NAACP. He ran for city council to give members of his community a voice. Uh, and did many other things to, to be supportive. Ultimately, he was, and still is, uh, well recognized for his, uh, his inventions and, uh, and everything that he did to not only support uh, the world at large, but his community in particular. And if I can just close uh, with this, I'd like to say that, you know, Garrett Morgan charted his own course. He defied the low expectations that were placed on him by society, and he lived a life of service. And in the process, he made the world a better place for us all. His contributions were really considerable, and I'm quite proud of them, but he's not unique. So I think together, it's really appropriate, and I'm so grateful that we are able to celebrate Black history, our history, together and acknowledge the contributions of so many others, some named, many unnamed, but not forgotten, who have made our nations great. And so with that, I say thank you again, and I'm open for any of your questions. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, it's a, a real honor to be able to listen to you share that personal story about your grandfather. I mean wow, what a man, there's so many points in that story where I just think, right, that's, a, that's an achievement, that's it, that's gonna stop, and then it goes on and goes on, and his intelligence and his determination um, is really quite inspiring, and, and you, you, you told us that story beautifully, so thank you so much. Um, a couple of comments that I'd like to share with you from the chat, um, and I'd encourage the audience to please throw in your questions and comments. Um, but the word wonderful has come up um, three or four times, Sandra, wonderful story, um, great information, inspiring is another word that I've seen come up again and again. Um, somebody's commented, I think this is Alan, our Consul General, thank you Alan, um, commented that um, his traffic signal innovation alone would have saved countless lives. Um, so yeah, it's, cool is another word that's come up, Sandra, very cool. So lo lots and lots of praise uh, for your wonderful grandfather. A couple of questions that have come in, let me ask them in order in which they've come in. Sure. So the first question um, that popped up in the Q&A was, um, one of our audience would like to know, do you still have many of your grandfather's artifacts and inventions? Um, and where are they? And, and could we see them as members of the public if we wanted to? You absolutely can. Um, you know, naturally, we have a few things, um, you know, that we keep close, close at hand um, to remind us of our legacy. Um, but we also want to share our legacy with everyone else. And so um, there are traffic signals and gas masks, um, you know, I won't say spread throughout the country, but um, here in Cleveland at the Western Reserve Historical Society, we have a set. There's a gas mask and a traffic signal um, because it's important to tell his story at, in his home. Um, there is also a, a traffic signal at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. It's been there for over 20 years and it is a part of an exhibit called America on the Move, Transportation from 1840 until 2000. It will be on exhibit for another two years approximately. It will be up um, on exhibit through 2023 which is the centennial of his traffic signal. And so that's pretty exciting for us. Um, there's a gas mask at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, which is just down the street. Um, and we also have some of his other ephemera there. So there's a gas mask, his uh, sales brochures, 
um, some of the uh, hair products and the, and the uh, advertisements for the hair products there as well. At some point in the future, um, both exhibits will come together. Um, we believe that they will bring the traffic signal to the African American Museum. So there will be the gas mask, the traffic signal, um, a, a number of um, brochures and other ephemera all displayed together. Um, and here in the Midwest, again, in Detroit, at the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, uh, Dr. Charles Wright and my father were social friends. Um, you know, they were card playing pals. Uh, and, uh, and so at any rate, um, when he decided to start this museum, um, my dad was very happy to give him um, a traffic signal to put into the museum. And I can still literally remember them wrapping it in old blankets and shoving it into the back of his station wagon um, after, well, they did that and then we all had dinner together. Um, and then Dr. Wright uh, and his wife drove back to Detroit. So the, that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, you are able to see uh, a number of his, um, his uh, inventions in the, around the country, and I would that the the uh, traffic signal in particular, well, the gas mask too, but the traffic signal is the one that he used in order to get the patent. So you can literally see the all marks uh, in the wood um, from his carving, which is really kind of cool. It is. It is kind of cool. So I'm jealous of the story of you wrapping it as well in the blanket as well. You got to be a part of history there yourself. Um, another member of the audience has, has asked, um, the Cleveland Call, the, the paper that your, your grandfather um, created, established, um, is that something that's still being published or is it transformed into something else? No, the Call and Post is still uh, in publication. It's one of the longest running African American, like continually running African American newspapers uh, in the country and has a quite a large um, Distribution still here in the state of Ohio. The Call and Post is also, I mean, it's it's a Cleveland-based paper, but they also distribute it in Columbus and Cincinnati. And now the publisher, <laughs> it's uh, it's funny because the publisher of the Call and Post now is uh, none other than Don King. Wow. Um, I'm going to read a comment out and then there's a question that, that kind of relates to it as well, that they, they tie in together. So um, one of the audience has commented, what an incredible story, Sandra, and what a prolific man. Um, it breaks my heart that he did not get the recognition and commendations he deserved in his own time because of systemic racism and inequality. I'm really honored to hear his story now, so thank you. And then the question that relates to that, um, I think, um, is, um, Another member has, has commented that there are so many shocking moments in the story. Um, how do you think your grandfather was able to process something like having to send a white man to the expo in his place? And do you have any sense of, of how he then explained that to his family? Well, you know, um, he if he was nothing else, he was pragmatic. If you'll recall, he, it's, he was born during Reconstruction. Um, and that was uh, that was standard treatment of, of African Americans, and not only African Americans, but other um, minority groups as well. Uh, so um, it was it, he expected it. You know, I mean, it wasn't anything that was new or shocking for him. This was the way society was at the time. And so I, I personally think um, it was clever. And he also, I mean, he recognized the indignity of it all, but you know what? He worked through it um, because he, number one, he wanted to make sales. He wanted his product to be successful and he was bound and determined to make that happen. You know, his, um, his parents were slaves, okay? They were enslaved on a, on a plantation. Um, that was owned by John Hunt Morgan of Morgan's Raiders. And it's, uh, it's, it's funny because his, his father, my great-grandfather, um, was, um, was John Hunt Morgan's son. And, you know, we are, we're kind of working through all of this now um, because they reached out to us. You know, we doubted the story, really, um, and, and amazingly, they came to us and said, this is an open secret in our family. 
So, you know, race relations were very complex uh, back then. They continue to be, quite frankly. Um, but th things were very complex back then. And, you know, my grandfather didn't have any illusions as to what expectations were of him and where people placed him in society. Uh, again, he broke through all of those barriers and more and lived a, lived a life of, um, you know, he was a confident man. He filled a room and, uh, and he, lived, he lived his life as he wanted to and as he saw fit. So, um, you know, there was, no, there was no need to explain to his family because they understood perfectly as well, um, you know, what the deal was and, uh, and they were living their best life, quite simply. Thanks for that, Sandra. That, that's really helpful. Um, a couple of, of related questions around, um, you mentioned in, in your, um, early on in your, your conversation with us, Granville T. Woods. Um, a couple of people in the audience are interested um, to know a couple of other examples of black entrepreneurs, um, perhaps people who didn't quite get the recognition that they should have in their time. I don't know if you have any that you could share from Ohio or, or other states that you're aware of. Yeah, well, goodness gracious. I mean, there are, there are a million and one stories um, of black entrepreneurship and black inventiveness um, you know, that, uh, that doesn't get highlighted all over the place. I mean, the monkey wrench literally was invented, um, you know, by an African-American. Uh, car refrigeration, meaning, you know, boxcar refrigeration was invented. Um, the patents are held by an African-American. You know, if we place this into context, um, African-Americans were not allowed to hold patents until after, uh, after emancipation because they were chattel. And it was considered that anything they came up with automatically belonged to their owners. And so it didn't stifle innovation necessarily, but it's, it stifled sharing. So, um, you know, once, uh, once that was, once there was emancipation and people could really do for themselves, um, you know, there was, a, there was just a lot going on. Uh, you know, in Ohio, I think that there are, there are just so many stories. There are so many writers and inventors and educators. Um, you, you know, I think about Langston Hughes. You know, we know Langston Hughes as being a great poet and playwright and that sort of thing. You know, his grandfather was one of the first um, lawyers and judges in the state of Ohio his grandfather. You know, there, there's lots of greatness. Uh, there's, there's lots of greatness in between the lines. I, we are very fortunate that my grandfather's story is one now that's being told. Um, and, you know, I think rightly so. But, you know, his is just one of many. Thank you, Sandra. Um, it, it's almost a related question, I suppose, but do you have any sense of, of who your grandfather um, might have rubbed elbows with back in the day? Any names that we might recognize? Um, perhaps people that were his mentors or his influences or, or just colleagues? Yeah, well, you know what, I have actually kind of a fun story um, to, to share. And, and this is, uh, you know, this is really, I think, kind of cool. My, um, when he, my dad, my grandfather had three sons, and his eldest son is named John Pierpoint Morgan, J.P. Morgan, all right? So ordinarily, and my, my father is Garrett Morgan Jr., you know, and my dad was the middle son, the pickle in the middle, you know, and you would think, wow, why wouldn't you name your first son, you know, your firstborn after you? Well, you know what? This goes back again to the safety hoods. My grandfather was having a tough time selling his safety hoods. All right. And it was the Garrett Morgan safety hood. And people knew that he was black and he was like, oh, what am I going to do? Well, the long and the short of it is that J.P. Morgan had business in Ohio and in Cleveland in particular. And my grandfather who was never shy, reached out, you know, found the, found the connections to get to J.P. Morgan and said, oh, you know, ha, 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 we have the same last name, D, 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 whatever. I heard that you like to hunt. You know, I'm a hunting um, fan myself, and he sent him a hunting dog, okay? Some, don't ask me what kind of dog, but sent him some sort of dog that, that likes to hunt, okay? And J.P. Morgan was struck by that, and it, it started 
a dialogue between the two of them. And, you know, as a part of that conversation, my grandfather said, you know, I don't know what to do. Initially, would you invest in my, in my gas masks? You know, that, that sort of thing. And he said, nah, I'm not going to invest in your gas masks, but I'm going to give you some advice here. You know, why don't you take the, the Garrett A off the, off the Morgan safety hood and just call it the Morgan safety hood. Okay. You know what? We are friends and I will acknowledge that you know, in the wider uh, scheme of things. And then let's pe let people make the, you know, use that association to, um, you know, to decide in their own minds what whatever they think. We know that it's the Morgan, Garrett Morgan safety hood, but based on our relationship, people are gonna think maybe it's the JP Morgan safety hood or that I've had some, some influence in there. The long and short of it is it worked. You know, it was, it was a way for my grandfather to revive his sales. The sales were not nearly as, as um, fast as they were before, uh, you know, the, the crib disaster, but um, he, did, he did increase sales and, and continue to grow his business. So my grandfather named my Uncle John after him, let him know, and J.P. Morgan sent my Uncle John then um, a savings bond right, and a nice little letter, which um, my grandfather never cashed the, sa the savings bond, and, and we still have the letter. That's so that was, his big, that was the big person that he rubbed elbows with. That's some good elbow rubbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, a question, Sandra, that, that brings this around to you a little bit, so I really like this question. Um, so obviously you've described to us your, your grandfather as an entrepreneur, an inventor, a civic leader and also a family man. So he's, he's such an impressive character that you've just described. Which of his values do you try and incorporate most into your own life and how do you do that? Well, um, you know, I think a couple of things. Number one, um, our grandfather taught us to be comfortable in our own skin. You know, to when you look in the mirror, you should like and appreciate who you are. Um, and, and, you know, your accomplishments we, to always strive, always, um, you know, be the best that you can be to use your education to get one, first of all, and then to use your education, um, you know, to, the, to be your absolute best. Number two, that the most important thing that we can do is to live a life of service. And you can never turn your back on your fellow man and you must always strive to bring someone up with you, okay? Because your success really can only be reflected in who you help and what you do for your community. And I think those are the most important um, aspects of my grandfather's uh, life that we all bring forward. And certainly I do. Thank you for that. That I will carry those words um, beyond today, well into into the rest of the year and beyond that. That's really um, really great to hear from you, Sandra. Thank you so much. I um, I have a question of my own um, that is around what was your understanding of your grandfather when you were growing up, and when did you realize his significance and and his achievements? Well, you know we. It, needless to say, my dad's name was Garrett Morgan Jr., right? And so um, I lived with Garrett Morgan every day. Um, and the, you know, the traffic signal at that time was not in a museum, it was in our living room, right? Uh -huh. Monitoring traffic. We used to say monitoring traffic down the hall to the, to the bathroom, okay? So um, I think that I was always, uh, I was always cognizant of, of him and, and his importance in our community. Um, because within the African-American community anyway, um, he was a well-known entity, um, you know, socially, economic, and otherwise. And so I was, I was well aware. And black history was important in our family. You know, I remember, frankly, crying because, you know, it was time to get new coloring books and all of my friends were getting the Flintstones and the Jetsons and I got, um, Phyllis Wheatley and Benjamin Banneker. 
All right. And I thought, why do I have to have these? You know, I, I want the other ones. I want what everybody else has. Um, in hindsight, of course, it was, uh, you know, it was a tremendous learning opportunity. Um, and it was the right thing to, it was the right thing to do. You know what, we, we became very aware of who we were, not only as a, as a member of the Morgan family, but as an African American as well, you know, and, and, um, you know, I guess that's, uh, you know, that's kind of it. We were, we always knew who he was. And when I was in, I mean, in kindergarten, uh, show and tell, um, and, uh, you know, I got sick of taking Barbie or whoever with me uh, to school. And I asked my dad if I could take the gas mask and he said I could. And so we together, obviously, um, you know, went to school and, and talked about it and demonstrated the, uh, the safety hood. And then my dad let me wear it. And, uh, you know, while he was talking to the teacher, I was chasing kids around the room with it, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it, anyway, uh, I, I think we knew from a, a right, right from the start, right from the get go, um, that he was a very special person and that we had a, we had a, a, a really um, special legacy. That's great. I mean, he, he deserves to be um, understood and recognized, certainly by his own family in that way. I think that brings us to the end of our questions, Sandra. Okay. I, I have a comment that I, I'd love to finish on on my side before I hand over to you for, for some final words. But um, one of our audience has shared something which I think is a really great way to wrap things up on the audience side. So the comment is, um, I have a four-year-old son called Aidan who's in daycare. In February 2019, his two-year-old class teacher taught them about different black inventors all month. And one of them was Garrett Morgan. And Aidan then told my wife and I that he learned about Garrett Morgan and he created the stoplights. Neither my wife nor I knew of Garrett Morgan at the time and we're really proud that Aidan was taught about your grandfather when he was two. I thought that was a wonderful way to, to kind of feed back to you. Yeah. Um, I'm a little thrilled bit. to hear it. Yeah, that's really exciting to know. And you know, and I'm grateful for all of these things. The first Garrett Morgan school in the country was in Chicago, PS, wow. um, even before in Cleveland. Um, and now they're scattered throughout the country. You know, I mean, they're, they're all over the place, but um, it's always exciting to know that, um, that my grandfather is a part of, I mean, that people learn about him in school right? That he is a part of the educational fabric of, of this country. And just like we learn about, you know, George Washington or, or anybody else, um, you know, Susan B. Anthony or any of the other um, people of history and of uh, business importance that we learn about, uh, that we learn about Garrett Morgan. It's, um, it's a legacy that I am eternally grateful for um, because it has, it, you know, it's made me who I am. Uh, and it's also one that I'm super proud of, as you can imagine. Uh, and I'm always delighted to share um, with audiences and individuals like you. So thank you again for having me, um, for hosting me today. I hope that I didn't stumble around and I wasn't boring or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, again, just thank you. Andrea, you could never be boring. And with a story like this, no, you, you thoroughly held our interests throughout. Thank you so, so much. It was an honor to be able to listen to that today. I know our audience are hugely grateful as well. The session has been recorded for anyone that wants to share it. So we can, we can share the link for that. Just reach out to me. And I think we have some links that we'll share with you as well. Um, Freya's just posting them in the chat now so you can um, you can look up some more details so thank you so much again Sandra a real honor to, to be speaking you. to you again this morning and thank you for your time thanks to everyone who listened I appreciate it thank you everyone have a lovely weekend thanks you too